make a start. I'm going to continue with uh, homogeneous deformations today. And after doing a little bit more of theory, I'll give you some specific examples of where we have done work in GIFT to use this kind of a method to develop some new science, OK? <clears throat> now, in the last lecture, I explained to you the difference between a coordinate transformation matrix where the vector remains unchanged. All you are doing is expressing it in different coordinate systems. <clears throat> and a deformation where the coordinate system is fixed, but then you have uh, a couple of uh, different vectors. So an initial vector u, and as a consequence of the deformation, in general, you'll have a vector which points in a different direction and has a different length. And we managed to derive the deformation matrix for the Bain strain very easily by noting that, you know, in order to convert the austenite into the ferrite, you compressed along the z-axis and you expanded uniformly <coughs> along the x and y-axis. <coughs> and therefore, the matrix uh, whose column is given by the length of the 1, 0, 0 axis after deformation, okay? And then the second column is given by the 0, 1, 0 axis after deformation, and then the z-axis after deformation. So we ended up with a Bain strain, <coughs> which was simply eta 1, 0, 0, 0, eta 1, 0, and 0, 0, eta 3. Yeah? Do you remember that? And what is the meaning of eta 3? In terms of the lattice parameters, what would eta 3 be? Yeah, so it's the final length divided by the original length, which is A gamma, A alpha over A gamma. Okay. So we could do this just by looking at the crystal structure, right? So we knew that the deformation along this axis will be so much, so much, so much, and we just wrote down the matrix. So that is too simple, you know, in general, when we have uh, a deformation, we might be thinking about the rolling direction, transverse direction, and the normal direction. But we want to express that deformation in terms of the crystallographic axis rather than the sample axis. So we might have to do a transformation of the deformation to a different set of axes. So here, the coordinate system is the basis A, and here the coordinate system is the basis B. The vector V is exactly the same as the vector here, and u is exactly the same as the vector here. But we are going to refer these vectors now to different coordinate systems. So we need to be able to refer a deformation to any set of axes. Okay, so in this case, for example, the Bain strain is referred to the crystallographic axes of the gamma. So, okay, I might want to refer it to the rolling direction, the transverse direction, and the normal direction. So I'd have to do a coordinate transformation which expresses the same deformation in a different set of axes. In, in that way, you know, supposing we are looking at mechanical twinning occurring on the 111 plane in the 112 direction, okay? Then we know that the plane is, it doesn't have any change, okay? And that the shear is parallel to the plane. So if we define our axes to be in the plane and normal to the plane, it's easy to write down the deformation matrix. But we might want to refer it to the crystallographic axes, in which case it's a bit more complicated, right? So I'm going to go into something known as a similarity transformation, where we are, we are doing the same deformation, okay, but in different coordinate systems. Is everybody clear about this? Yeah. So here the vector v is exactly the same as this one, and this one is exactly the same as this, but we want to refer them to different coordinate systems. Okay. So how do I go from you know gamma b gamma to alpha b gamma? Okay. So, the property of a homogeneous deformation, uh, I explained to you in the last lecture, is that when you apply the deformation, you know, you don't introduce a kink in a vector. A line remains a line, 
Okay? And similarly, <coughs> line, uh, po sorry, points on a line remain in a straight line. And if you have lines in a plane, then after the deformation, they remain in the plane. The plane might have changed its orientation, but they remain in the plane. Yep? That is the meaning of a homogeneous deformation. And the way in which we operate on a vector u with the deformation s is we produce a new vector v. <coughs> so this is again emphasizing uh, the property of a homogeneous deformation, that if I have a direction u which becomes a new vector v, and similarly a plane h becomes deformed into a different orientation, k, right? So this is a plane normal, h becomes a new plane normal, k after the deformation. And if this vector u lies in the plane h, in other words, u dot h is 0, then it must be the case that v dot k is also equal to 0. In other words, the vector u which was in the plane h will be the vector v in the plane k where h becomes k and u becomes v. OK? So that necessarily follows. If I want to <coughs> express this in matrix notation, then I would uh, write it as u, uh, sorry, um, h a star into a u. That's the dot product between h and u. Do you remember that? If we express one vector in the reciprocal basis and the other one in the real basis, then we get a dot product there. So I can write that as h a star into a u. And similarly, I can write this as uh, k a star into v a. OK, so that's all I've done here. This is the dot product between h and u. And this is the dot product between k and v. Is that clear? Now, I can do, uh, I can replace this here, which is the final vector v, by this part. Yeah. Because look, a, uh, the vector v referred to the basis a is simply the vector u referred to the basis a times the deformation. So I'm taking that and replacing it with this term here. Yeah. So now, we can simplify this, because if I cancel, <coughs> cancel out the AU on both sides, yeah, can you see? Then I get H becomes K times S. That's what we expected. This is the way in which you represent the deformation of a plane normal. Compare that with the deformation of a direction. Okay, so. This is simply a derivation of how the plane normal would be deformed. H changes into K. Yep. Plane normals we express as a row vector. Everybody happy with that? OK, let's carry on now. What we want to do is we want to change the basis. <coughs> uh, sorry, before I change the basis, um, here we are transforming K by uh, deforming it into H. If I want to do the inverse deformation, I simply take the inverse of uh, ASA, multiply by both sides by the inverse, and I get this equation. OK? Everyone happy so far? OK, so all we've done up to now is expressed <coughs> how plane normals are deformed by S and how directions are deformed by S. OK? Right. So here's uh, ASA times U giving us V. Nothing new here. And similarly, uh, if I express the deformation S in the basis B, then I have the same form of equation that U operated by S gives me V. If I want to transform the coordinates of the vector U into the basis V, then I use a coordinate transformation matrix, right? And similarly here. I use a coordinate transformation matrix. So this is a deformation. This is a coordinate transformation matrix. 
Whoops. <coughs> so if we take this here, AJB into BV, <coughs> and replace AV on this side by this upper equation, then I get ASA into AJB times BU. Okay, let, let me write that down again. Okay, so what, what I want is so this is exactly the same as right? Yeah, this part is simply this. Yeah. So we've got AV on this side, ASA here, and I'm going to replace AU by this. Okay. So that is equal to ASA times uh, this is simply BV uh, AV. Sorry. And we replace this by okay. Now notice that I made uh, a mistake several times when I was writing on the board, and then I deleted, right? And you notice that you made a mistake as soon as you get the wrong terms adjacent to each other. So in this equation, you've got B, B next to each other, A, A next to each other, B, B next to each other. If you don't get that right, then you're making a mistake. OK? So everyone happy with this so far? Yeah. There's a, nothing complicated here. It's simply this is the vector V referred to the basis A. OK? Uh, this is the deformation, and this is the vector U referred to the basis A. OK? Now, in order to isolate BV, I multiply both sides by the inverse of this matrix here. So the inverse of AJB is BJA, right? So if I multiply both sides by BJA, then I get this. Okay. Notice again that like basis symbols are adjacent. Now, do you see what we've done? Yeah. This combination of three matrices is simply BSB. Yeah. So we've got BU on this side, we've got BB on this side, and this is actually BSB. So we've done what's known as a similarity transformation. We've said that BSB is equal to BJA times S times the inverse of BJA. Okay. So to do to transform a deformation into another coordinate system, you multiply by the coordinate transformation matrix and its inverse on the other side. Yep. So that's called a, a similarity transformation. So we are carrying out a similar deformation in two different coordinate systems. <clears throat> now we've already um, done one example of this, where you know, first of all, we derived a rotation matrix by looking at a diagram, OK? So we had two axes, two sets of axes at 45 degrees. And by looking at the diagram, we derived the rotation matrix. Do you remember? We had the coordinate system <coughs> uh, like this, and then another one like this. And by looking at the components, we derived the rotation matrix easily. And then I showed you a general rotation matrix. Yeah? So what I really did was I derived this simple rotation matrix and then expressed it in an arbitrary set of coordinates. And that's where we got the equation for the general rotation matrix. All right? Similarly, if I have the Bain strain and I want to express it in any arbitrary coordinate system, you know, the rolling direction, et cetera, then I can just use this similarity transformation to do that. OK? <clears throat> so let's, let's do some examples now. 
these are a class of deformations known as an invariant plane strain. Right? So an invariant plane strain. Invariant means something that is unchanged, undistorted, and unrotated, right? So notice that the horizontal plane is left unchanged by all of these deformations. Okay. Now the first deformation here, uh, if I start with this blue uh, cube, and I distort it along one direction, it's not going to change the horizontal plane. Okay? So this is like doing a tensile test but with a Poisson's ratio of zero. In other words, when you pull it, there's no contraction horizontally. And beryllium has a Poisson's ratio which is almost zero. So if you, do, if you pull it elastically, or uh, elastically, you will not, not get sideways contraction. Okay? So this is one kind of an invariant plane strain. This kind is, uh, you're very familiar with, it's a shear deformation. So when a dislocation glides, it causes a shear strain. And of course, the glide plane is unchanged by the motion of the dislocation, right? It remains exactly the same. And this is known as the dilatational strain. So it's because I've labeled this as one, this distance is, is the dilatational strain. Similarly, because this is labeled as one, S divided by the height is the shear strain, and the height is 1. And this is the most general class of invariant plane strain, where we have a combination of a shear deformation and a volume expansion normal to the invariant plane. Okay? And that is what happens with martensitic transformations, that you not only have a shear deformation, but you also have a volume change. Okay? And if you look at uh, plutonium, then the volume change is negative on Martin Siddick transformation. So, so this delta will be downwards. OK? See, so plutonium, uh, the density of the liquid is greater than that of the solid. So when the solid forms, it undergoes a whole series of Martin Siddick transformations on cooling, yep. which uh, increase the density. Right, so now I want to derive uh, coordinate transformation matrices for all of these deformations. Uh, and I've chosen very simple axes here. So here, Z1 and Z2 are in the invariant plane. Okay? And Z3 is pointing vertically. And uh, these are unit vectors here. Okay? So can you tell me what the deformation matrix would be for the dilatational uh, for, for this uniaxial extension. Okay. So remember, the first column of this matrix is the 1, 0, 0 direction, a vector equal to 1, 0, 0. What does that become after deformation? One, zero, zero. It remains as 1, 0, 0 because Z1 is in the invariant plane, right? What about the second column? Yeah, again, it's in the invariant plane. Z2 is in the plane, so it's not affected. And the third one? 0, 0, 1 plus delta. Because the z-axis is stretched by the amount delta, right? OK, somebody else tell me what it should be for the second one. Yeah, so again, you know, these two will be the same because the plane is not affected. Sorry? Oh, very good. So it's S, 0, and 1 because, look, this vector here has acquired a component along the uh, x1 axis. So it's S along x1, uh, 1 along uh, z3. Okay? Right, so just by looking at these two, what will be the third one? 
So, so I don't want you to look at the diagram. I want you to look at the board and tell me what it will be for the third one. Because isn't, isn't the third one a combination of uniaxial dilatation and shear? So we just need to add a delta here, right? And we've got the third one. <coughs> So just by, um, OK, that's uh, the first one, second one, and third one, OK? Just by looking at this, by choosing the axes conveniently, we can derive the deformation matrix. But you know, this axis here might correspond to the 1, 1, 1 axis in the crystallographic frame. And the horizontal axis might correspond to 1, 1 bar 2. So we haven't expressed this deformation in the crystallographic axes. We've expressed it in the simple axes. So now I want to convert this into the crystallographic axis. So all I have to do is a coordinate transformation between the Z frame and the crystallographic frame. Yeah? Because we know from, wh from what I've just said, Uh, the Z3 is parallel to 1, 1, 1 of the crystallographic axis. Yeah? The 1, 1, 1 plane is the shear plane, say. Okay? And we know that um, Z1 is parallel to 1, 1 bar 2, the shear direction. Okay? So I've given you two vectors which are parallel from both. So going back to yesterday's lecture, the third one can be derived by a cross product. Convert these into equalities instead of parallelisms, and you've got your coordinate transformation matrix. Yeah? Once you've got your coordinate transformation matrix, you simply do a similarity transformation on this, and you've got this in the crystallographic uh, axes. Yeah? So uh, let's assume we've got the coordinate transformation matrix. So this is a crystallographic basis, and this is the basis on the board. Then that times Z, P, Z, times the inverse of this, which is Z, J, X, gives me X, P, X. Okay? So even though this is actually quite complicated when you look at it in the crystallographic axis, if you first start by defining it very simply, and then do a similarity transformation, then you can express it in the crystallographic axis or whatever axis you choose. Okay? So for example, rolling direction, transverse direction, and normal direction. Everyone happy with that? Okay. So, so you see the purpose of the similarity transformation is that just by looking at something, you know what the matrix should be, but it'll be in the simple axis. And then you transform it into your, the axis of your choice. <clears throat> so, supposing that uh, instead of using the crystallographic axis, I just make it completely arbitrary and I form my axes um, uh, to whatever I choose. I, I derive a general matrix for, for the deformation where P1 is the normal to the invariant plane, okay, a unit normal, because look, the dot product P, P times P is 1, and D is now our displacement vector, but a unit displacement vector. So if I just go back here, see, this is, this is D in this case, this is D, and this is D here, all right? And the magnitude of D is M here, it's S and delta here. So that's, that's a displacement direction. And the unit normal to the habit plane is, is this here, OK, P. <coughs> so an invariant plane strain, by doing this similarity transformation, I can prove that the general equation for the invariant plane strain is, is given by this. And the basis will depend on how you express D1 and P1. 
Is it in the crystallographic axis? Is it in, uh, in your simple axis or whatever? So this gives me the complete deformation matrix for an invariant plane strain. Okay? And if I simply substitute numbers into here, I get my matrix. Whatever axis you've chosen D and P to be in, the matrix will be in those axes. Happy with that? So it's, it's like that general rotation matrix that we derived. <clears throat> now I can actually write this in a, in a more economical way. So this is my invariant plane strain. Okay? And we are, we are going to use this a lot when we come to martensitic transformations. Yeah? So this is the description of a general invariant plane strain. And I can write it more economically as that. Now, you might be confused. Yeah, this is a 3 by 3 matrix, isn't it? And these two are not. This is an identity matrix, which is a 3 by 3 matrix. But can you see that this is 3 by 3? Yes. How come? 3 by 1 for now and 1 by 3. Yeah, so. yeah. <clears throat> so, so the order in which this is written is that this is a single column matrix and this is a single row matrix. So if I take a column here, which is D1, D2, D3, and multiply it by a row, which is P1, P2, P3, then it's row times column, row times column, row times column, row times column. So I have a 3 by 3 matrix here. So the, so the elements of this matrix will be D1, P1, then D1, P2, and so on. So this is an economical way of writing. And it's easy to prove that the inverse of this matrix here will be the identity matrix minus, uh, minus the same thing multiplied by a scalar Q. OK? So you can find uh, a simple proof of this in my textbook. You don't need to know this here. Yeah? It's just a simple expression of what's given over here, OK? Now, when we were uh, discovering how to find the rotation axis, you know, we said that the rotation axis doesn't change when you, uh, when you rotate one crystal into the other. That's obvious, right? Because it's the rotation axis, and it remains invariant. With a deformation, you should be able to find uh, certain vectors which are unrotated. They might be stretched or contracted, but they are unrotated. And if, if you have, uh, for, for example, in the Bain strain, we had the z-axis and the x and the y-axis were unrotated. They were simply extended or contracted. And we call them the principal axes, right? Now, in mathematics, you call them eigenvectors, all right? So those are vectors which are stretched or contracted, but not rotated. And the amount by which they are stretched or rotated, uh, stretched or uh, compressed, are the eigenvalues. Yeah? So it's just a fancy set of names for exactly what we described in the last lecture, the principal axes and the principal distortions. OK? So how do we find uh, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues? Well, we do exactly as we did for the rotation axis, except this time you can stretch and compress as well. So the vector u remains parallel to the vector u, but it's multiplied by a scalar quantity, which gives you the amount of compression or extension. Okay? So, so any, any, uh, any vector which satisfies this equation is an eigenvector. All right? So if I rearrange this by taking lambda au onto this side, I get ASA minus lambda times the identity matrix times that equals 0. OK, so this is simply this equation again, uh, re rewritten here. And if I write this in full, then I have, uh, have uh, an equation like this. <coughs> All right. So there are actually three equations here, because it's S11 minus lambda times U1 plus S12 times U2 plus S13 times U3 equals 0, OK, and so on. So I have three equations, and I have three axes. 
which are unrotated and undistorted. So I should be able to solve the three equations to give me, give me those numbers. But first I need to know the, the eigenvalues, the three different lambda values. And to do that, I take a determinant of this matrix here. And that will give me an equation which is cubic in lambda. So you will have three solutions for lambda. Okay, so those are your three eigenvalues. You then pick one of those values, all right? And you substitute it into here, and you get three equations, which you solve to give you the first axis. Then you take the second value of lambda from your cubic solution, substitute into this, solve for the second axis, and so on. Yeah, so just to give you an example, let's imagine we have this as our deformation matrix. And I remove lambda from, from these terms because uh, if you remember, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just writing uh, this matrix here. Okay. So we have this uh, set of uh, equations, and I take the determinant of that. That means, you know, minus 6 into this times this, minus this times this. And this into this times uh, this times this minus this times this. You know how to do a determinant, right? Then I get an equation which is cubic. And therefore, you know, I get lambda 1 is 12, lambda 2 is 30, and lambda 3 is 18. I then take one value here and substitute it into these, uh, into these equations, OK? So I get a set of three equations. So I had 18 over here, and I removed 12. I have 6, 6 u1, minus 6 u2, minus 6 u3, and minus 6 u1, 21 minus 12 will be 9 u2, and so on. So if I solve these equations simultaneously, I get u as this vector. So this vector is unrotated by the deformation, OK? But it may be stretched or contracted according to this eigenvalue. I do this again using lambda 2, and I get the second eigenvector. And I do this again using lambda 3, and I get a third eigenvector. So for any, any deformation for which you have a symmetrical deformation matrix, you will be able to find three real eigenvectors and three eigenvalues. And the reason why I say a symmetrical deformation matrix is that that is called a pure deformation. That means you are able to describe it in terms of just stretching and contraction along three axes. An impure one is a pure plus some kind of a rotation. Okay? That, that will not give you three real eigenvectors. Okay? So this is the difference between stretch and rotation. This is an impure deformation. Um, we've, we've got shear here, simple shear. And if you have the matrix for this, it will not be symmetrical. Now, do you remember we derived the uh, invariant plane strain uh, matrices, the simple ones? They were not symmetrical, right? You had 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and delta 0, uh, or 0, um, S, 0, 1 plus delta. That's not symmetrical. So that isn't a pure deformation. This is a pure deformation where you can find three axes which are unrotated by the deformation. Okay? So if I take this and I rotate this ellipse so that you know, we get this configuration, then this is a combination of stretch and rotation. Now, you may have done this previously in Professor Dong Lee's lectures, where you, you, where you take the symmetrical part of the strain tensor, yeah, and you call that uh, the pure deformation, and then the asymmetrical part, sorry, the one of those, okay, the, yeah, the symmetrical part is the stretch, and the asymmetrical part gives you the rotation. Okay? But in elasticity theory, which he dealt with, um, the strains are infinitesimal. Yeah? So you can make many approximations. 
Here we are dealing with large strains. So I will show you how to decompose this into uh, pure deformation and a rotation in another lecture. Yeah. So now I want to show you some examples how you can solve real problems uh, in, in your subject using what we've learned so far. Okay? And I'll begin by showing you, you know, why you should do metallurgy. Okay? Yeah. This is me in Brazil. Okay? Now only metallurgists get to do this free of charge. You know, the company pays for it. Okay? So there's this beautiful steel company located in Brazil right next to the beach. Beautiful flowers and you know, this is the conference center and, and lots of fruit you can just pick from the trees. And this is the first ingot that was cast at that steel plant uh, many, many years ago. And the most beautiful part of it, you know, is not the beach, is this wonderful uh, rolling mill. Absolutely spotlessly clean, no human beings to be seen because it's all computer controlled. Yeah? And why do you think we are doing the rolling process? You know, I mean, this, this equipment itself will cost something of the order of $500 million. Yeah? Why are we bothering to invest so much in rolling technology? What is the main purpose? What are the main purposes of rolling? Why do we roll things? Yeah, you want to, first of all, you want to produce the right shape. If you looked at that ingot, you know, it was more or less like a big square lump, right? And you can't make a car out of that. So you form it into shape. And we've been doing rolling, you know, for more than, uh, perhaps more than 200 years, right? But we weren't doing it with equipment which cost $500 million. So what is special about what we are doing to the material? What is our goal in, in controlling the rolling process, apart from producing shape? <coughs> yeah? Control microstructure. Control microstructure. Very good. So what aspect of the microstructure is very important in this? Fine Sorry? Fine grain size. Fine grain size, okay. So around 1960, when you were, you were not born probably, yeah, there was a huge revolution in the steel industry. That was the introduction of microalloying additions, right? Completely changed the properties of steels, you know, revolutionarily. And now there are something of the order of, uh, I would say, 